this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, and for the third segment in our series on score reading, let's read a score together now. Mozart Symphony No. 40 in G minor. Before you read a new work, I recommend that you look carefully at the instrumentation and the layout of the score. Let's take a close look at this score now, starting with the strings. Notice how the basses and cellos share a staff. That is a pretty common practice all the way up to early romantics like Mendelssohn, before composers started to give more independence to the bass section. In our case, it just makes it easier to read. A little higher on the page are the horns. These are natural horns without valves, so they can only play open tones based on the harmonic series to which each horn is tuned. The first horn is tuned to B flat, so it can play the minor third of the G minor chord, plus other notes that allow Mozart to modulate to keys like D minor or E flat major. The second horn is in G, the tonic of the piece, which also gives Mozart the strong D he needs, plus he can also modulate to strange places like B major. Finally, at the top of the score we have the winds. Notice how all the parts are on separate staves. I notated the score like this so that you could more easily see the independence of the individual lines. At the top, just one flute, and that's all that Mozart needs. Then doubled winds for the rest of the section. This symphony was originally scored for just flutes, oboes, and bassoons, but Mozart then made an expanded version to include clarinets, taking some of the lines from the oboes. Mozart was actually the first significant composer to introduce clarinets into the orchestra, and we are sort of looking at orchestrational history in the making here. So now, let's read the opening of the first movement. As we go along, I'll highlight the melody so you can pick it out pretty easily. That's far enough to go on for now. Let's back up a little and think about what we just heard. First and most obvious, this illustrates the dominance of the strings in the classical scoring. And it's interesting how clearly their individual parts stand out. For instance, just a handful of violas are holding down the rhythmic pulse at the beginning, while both sections of violins play an octave melody. What's most noticeable about the winds is the delicacy with which Mozart uses them. They're introduced with this counter melody of bassoon, clarinet, and flute playing in a triple octave. From there, Mozart mostly keeps the winds to the background, serving a harmonic role, though later in the symphony there are numerous solos and thematic leading. The real masterstroke comes in this tutti at the end. Where a romantic composer might double the first violins to really get the point across, Mozart just lets them stand alone. Or does he? Let's take another look. Notice how the important notes of the violin melody are supported by surrounding players in a way that underlines what the violins are doing, yet doesn't get in the way. Yet another ingenious bit of scoring from the maestro. Now, let's turn to the next movement, the Andante. I love the way that Mozart makes this simple arrangement seem to float along, suspended, yet very calm, even when the music gets big.
listen to that sample, I suggest you go back and read it through one more time, and this time listen and watch for all the things that my notes didn't mention. Notice how the horns act as a gateway between the winds and the strings, sometimes providing extra voices for the strings, sometimes supporting the texture of the wind harmony. Check out how the simple scoring provides a surprisingly free landscape in which Mozart can modulate from the original key of E-flat to anywhere he likes, D-flat, E-flat minor, G-flat, and then ending in F of all places. And go over the structure of that tutti, how the harmonic and rhythmic elements build enormous tension over four bars without any increase of volume written in the score. finish with the opening of the third movement. This is some of the finest scoring Mozart ever did, just on this one page. I'll run the music now with the built-in repeat so you can read it twice. Let's take this perfectly balanced bit of musical clockworks apart from the bottom up, starting with the lower strings. The cellos and basses are playing a pretty standard line at first, but then notice this daisy chain of motives at the end, down a fifth, up a second, connecting in a downward spiral that only breaks at the end in order to complete the cadence. The violas are a different story, they play an intertwining game, crossing the cello line quite often to play a lower tone. The bassoons double the cellos most of the time, but in the middle they pick up the viola line for a few bars. This may seem a bit piecemeal, but when you look at the horns and see which parts they are doubling, it all falls into place somewhat, as they provide support to either the violas or cellos, based on their tuning. And the horizontal continuity of each line gives each player a logical, satisfying part to dig into. Now, let's jump to the high strings, playing the melody in unison at first, then in octaves, just like the first movement. They are doubled, then tripled an octave higher by the flute, which is barely audible, but serves to reinforce the upper harmonics of the melodic line, rather than to be heard in its own right. As for the rest of the winds, the oboes and clarinets are doubling each other for the whole page. The first six bars are a four-voice unison countermelody, but then at bar seven the parts split, with the firsts doubling the melody and the seconds continuing the countermelody. Then for two bars, all four players drive home the melody before returning to a middle voice counterpoint. So that's what all these instruments did from the viewpoint of an orchestrator, but of course that's only scratching the surface. Every great piece has many different facets that can help build your perceptions as a musical thinker, and then your craft as an orchestrator. And every great orchestrator is, or was, a keen student of other great composers. So go ahead and read the rest of the score on your own now, and look for all the elements that make the music stick in your mind. When you run across that part that really speaks to you and your approach as an orchestrator, send me a message and let me know what it was. Thank you.